Uh, I've, uh, I've always enjoyed my conversations with Anton in particular. Whenever I talk to Anton, I almost feel like it's my birthday because I, I walk away much happier than when I walked in and I, I leave with many uh, things to play with, whether they be, you know, uh, Anton's new mathematical discoveries or striking conjectures. So thank you, Anton. Um, okay, so uh, okay, I'm going to be talking about largeness asymptotics in flat surfaces. So let's fix um, some g, which will eventually be a genus, and n, uh, which will both be integers. Uh, and we'll, I mean, for us, g will always be basically going to infinity. But for now, I mean, I'll just do a fairly weak constraint, which is that 2g plus n is at least 3. And we'll let q uh, gn. So this is the moduli space. Um, of quadratic differentials of genus G uh, with n simple poles, uh, and n simple poles. So these are the set um, of all x q where. This is my uh, differential, quadratic differential, with n simple poles. And this is my Riemann surface. Of genus G. OK. Um, so we'll let mu denote the maser of each uh, measure on, uh, on, on this QG of n. Uh, also, basically, as this, this measure has been discussed many times throughout this program. Uh, it's just a Lebesgue measure on the set of periods. Um, and uh, we'll set vol QG of n to just denote the volume of QG of n. Under, under this measure, OK? So, OK, so the theorem that goes back to the independent works of Mason Beach 40 years ago by this point is that this volume is non-trivial in the sense that it's not 0 and not infinite. And so the question that we're interested in is, is what is it? What is it? What is it doing? OK, so the first question is, is how do you compute it at all? Uh, and by this point, there are there are many different approaches to computing it. I can I can list at least five or six uh, right now. So I mean, so the, I think maybe the original one that 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 applied in in, in fairly broad generality was by Eskin and Okunkov, who uh, who provided an algorithm. Uh, for doing this based on asymptotic Hurwitz theory. And, and this algorithm was implemented um, uh, by, by Elise, so uh, about 10 years later in a, in a computer program. She went, went up to something like genus maybe 11, um, around, around that. Uh, another approach was in the, in the work of Mirzikhani. Uh, on uh, the earthquake flow, who related it to um, uh, to counts of hyperbolic geodesics, and this is uh, much related to the say Alex's talk, um, the relation between the flat land and the and the, and the hyperbolic land. Um, another approach was much more recent, and uh, this is the one due to Vincent, Elise, uh, Peter, and Anton. Okay, uh, so that's not Anton. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, and they did it through a relation to, 
to, uh, to ribbon graph counts. And this, and actually both of these, will draw a relation to intersection numbers of certain side classes on the moduli space. And I'll get, I'll get to that later. Okay. Um, yet another approach. Uh, Uh, was due to Dawe, Martin, Ad uh, Adrian, uh, then uh, sort of. I mean, so this, this was sort of the original, and, and then it got massaged to to a certain extent by uh, Kasarian and uh, Young, Sagie, uh, Zhang. And this is recursions based on intersection theory and we saw a little bit I mean we saw big hints of this back in and in, 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 in Martin's talk um, the first talk of this program though he was more looking at Euler characteristics but I mean uh, other formulas also apply to these volumes okay and then there's a a list of seven people whose names I will not list, but I will say them. So Anderson, Barreau, Charbonnier, Delacroix, Giacchetto, Lewanski, and Wheeler. And uh, they have a topological recursion um, for, for, for these uh, volumes. Okay, so, okay, so hopefully I, I've made the point clear that there's a, a fair number of ways Okay, so hopefully I made the point clear though by this point that there's a, a fairly large number of ways to compute these volumes. And what I want to know is what happens when these things go to infinity. What happens to these to these volumes when the genus goes to infinity? Okay, so let, let me let me tell you what happens if you start. I mean, I have many ways. I mean, we have many ways by this point to compute the volumes. I can pick one of them and, and just compute, right? So here, here's here's an example of just when I take the genus to be four, uh, what what this thing looks like. So. So it's going to look like okay. So this is, I mean, so this is at genus four, and now okay. When when I get to genus one hundred, it's going to be a five eighty five digit number divided by a seven fifteen digit number times pi to the maybe four oh two. Okay, so this is not. I mean, it, 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 this might not be. Uh, Oh yeah, I, I was considering it. <laughs> I was considering it, but then I realized that I had to write down 1,200 digits, and then I thought maybe by 20 digits you'd start laughing, and then by 50 digits you'd start crying. So <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe not, maybe not the best idea. Um, okay, so um, okay, so here's a well, let's. Okay, so uh, so here's the theorem. Okay, so let's fix n. So n, you give you n as say ten um, or, or or zero. I mean, okay. So then, as as the genus tends to infinity, we have the volume of Q G of n is scaling like four over pi times. Uh, 8 over 3 to the 4g plus n minus 4, 2 to the n. Um, so, th so that's a pretty explicit, explicit expression for what these volumes are doing as g tends to infinity. And when I write this tilde, what I mean is that the left side divided by the right side tends to 1 as the genus tends to infinity. And again, I'm fixing, I'm fixing n, so I'm not, I'm not looking at some kind of scaling. Although you, you, can, you can start to try to, to tune them if one likes, although I, I won't do that for the purposes of this talk. Um, Okay, so the proof is based um, on an analysis of 
the, the, I guess the fourth of those, those methods I wrote up there, so these, these, uh, these, these formulas of uh, the four authors, uh, Elise, uh, uh, sort of Vincent, Elise, uh, Peter, and, and Anton. And, what, what, and actually what these formulas do is they not only compute the volume, but they compute various contributions to the volume. So like, um, vol I mean, much like what Vincent was talking about, volumes that have a given number of cylinders and some sort of uh, cylinder decomposition, things like that. So when you do this, you will actually be able to get, uh, this will actually provide refinements of volumes uh, which in particular enable you to uh, uh, you to analyze statistics of random square tile surfaces. And I'll get to these a little bit later. And before getting there, though, I want to talk a little bit, I mean, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about sort of applications about what you can do with them right now. But before getting on to sort of geometric statistics, let me talk about um, Siegel Beach constants, which have also played a, a role in this, in this program. So okay, so, um, so let's fix some uh, some quadratic differential, okay? And we'll fix some length, L, and we'll set an area of L to be equal to the sum uh, of A of C. So A is area, C is ranging over all cylinders. Okay, and then I'm going to require the, the circumference of the cylinder to be at most L. So this W is the circumference. Okay, so this is, so what you're kind of doing here is you're counting cylinders weighted by area. So if you view a cylinder as like a closed geodesic, you can't literally count those because there are uncountably many of them, right? If I shift up and down, I, I mean, I still get a closed geodesic. So you're kind of uh, thickening a closed geodesic all the way up so that it creates a maximal cylinder. Uh, should be maximal cylinders, okay? Um, and then, and then, okay. So then I count them, count them, count them there. So this is kind of some kind of weighted count of closed geodesics, okay? So uh, the theorem that goes back to Alex Eskin and Howard Mazur, um, uh, slightly over twenty years ago by this point, is that uh, the limit. Uh, one over pi L squared and area of L X exists and does not, it does not depend, um, on the choice of a uh, mu typical sort of, uh, mu typical. So like, or mu generic, maybe I should say, uh, xq. So if I take basically there's a there's a measure one there's a full measure subset of of, of of xq for which this this limit exists and and, and is constant on the, on that spot. Okay. So I mean okay. So now I know that some quantity exists. I mean uh, like a lot of people have been doing so far. You in principle want to compute it, and I mean what I want to do is take its 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 limit as the genus tends to infinity and see if there's any sort of structure universal behavior, a nice answer that comes out, much like, I mean, the sort of relatively nice answer that seems a little bit more appealing than, than this if I take a limit. Um, so, okay, so in terms of computing these things, um, in, the, in, the whole, in the case of holomorphic differentials, it was done by uh, Alex Eskin, Howard Mazur, and uh, Anton Zorich in 2003, and then um, Elise Picard in um, 2015. So they expressed these uh, Siegel Beach constants, these area Siegel Beach constants. I should call, I should give this a name. So I'll call it C area of QGN. 
uh, the C area in terms of volumes. And actually, in the case of, I mean, the principal stratum, which is really the one you're looking at here, um, this, this, this formula is, is fairly clean. I mean, it's, it's, a, fairly, it's a fairly simple formula. And, and it, what you can get from this is a, is a quick corollary. I won't try to impress you by writing what these things are in genus 4 or genus 100. I mean, I'll just tell you what the, what the limit looks like. So uh, the limit as g tends to infinity of the C area is equal to a quarter. Okay, so it's, it's, a fairly, it's a fairly simple answer. And the conjecture is that the same is actually true for all strata. All connected components, I mean, okay, let me not write compact connect, okay, so, so all connected components of any stratum. So uh, just to clarify what I mean by that, uh, this, this limit exists um, for, almo for, for almost any uh, XQ. Uh, okay, so I, 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 can, I, can fix, I can fix XQ in some stratum or some connected component of, of a stratum. Uh, this limit will exist for, for a mu generic uh, tra uh, path translation surface in that stratum. You can still talk about its area C equal each constant. And the conjecture is that as long as the number of poles is sort of bounded, re regardless of which stratum I take, the area C equal each constant should still tend to a quarter. Uh, non hyperelliptic. Yeah, yeah, non hyperelliptic. No, yeah, no, no, I should, yeah, yeah, sorry, non hyperelliptic. So. Okay, so it's a fairly universal, uh, a fairly universal property should, should show up, and this conjecture was due to myself and then these, uh, these four. So yeah. Okay, so that's a. Uh, okay, so that's on the Siegel Beach constants. Sorry. Yeah, this is, I'm counting by area. Yeah, I, I didn't, yeah, I'm, I'm not, this is not a, this is not a count. I'm not counting yet. I will, we will count the number of cylinders soon enough. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get there. Um, okay. okay, so let me now actually turn to Francisco's question, which is about the geometry of, 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 of these, of these flat surfaces. Um, okay. So what we'll do is we'll consider uh, consider a uniformly random square child surface um, with with at most n squares and genus G. And I'll, I'll say no poles for now. Uh, although you can, you can, you can make this work when you start putting the poles in. But uh, let's, let's just avoid avoid that for now. And the limit regime we'll do is we'll first let n tend to infinity, which is the classical thing that we've been seeing before, uh, and then we'll let then then we'll let g tend to infinity. Okay. So sort of if I let n tend to infinity, I'm kind of using these flat surfaces to I mean these square child surfaces to approximate a flat surface. And then I'll let the genus tend to, tend to, tend to infinity to get, a, to get some idea of what these, these flat su surfaces are doing in the, in the limit of large genera. Okay. Okay, so now if I take my, my score child surface, I can look at its horizontal foliation. And this gives rise to a cylinder decomposition. Okay, and then the question is, what can you say about the cylinder decomposition? And th there are a number of very remarkable results. I mean, this is th th that volume, that volume asymptotic is a starting point, but I mean, it's a it's a very small starting point in comparison to what's actually done uh, in, in 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 the works of uh, Vincent, Elise, uh, Peter, and Anton, who gave a very precise understanding of of what is going on in the cylinder de decomposition. So let me, let me let me explain a little bit about about what, 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 what we know now about it. Um, so, so what, okay, so the first is that the number of cylinders, let me say the number of cylinders, I'll just call that n-cil, uh, or maybe I can call it the, the number of cylinders. 
So this is like a Poisson random variable. Uh, so this, this is a random variable that's of the form e to the minus lambda times lambda to the k over k factorial. So this is the probability that my random variable is equal to k, and k is some, uh, some non-negative integer. So you can see that these add to 1. The thing I haven't told you is what the lambda is, and that's called the parameter of the Poisson random variable. So they said basically it's Poisson with the parameter uh, half uh, log 6g minus 6 plus uh, gamma plus 2 log 2 minus 2. And this gamma is the euler macheroni constant. Uh, this is the euler macheroni constant. Um, Okay, so it's a, it's a very precise understanding of what the number of cylinders are doing. Okay, you can also say what the probability is that all cylinders, so I've given you the number of the cylinders, but what are they actually doing? What do the cylinders look like? So you can ask what the probability is that all cylinders have height less than or equal to a. So this is, this is going to converge to root a over a plus 1. So in particular, the, the probability that all cylinders have height 1 is equal to 1 over root 2, OK? I, I'll, I, there, there are many other results. I mean, you can do large deviations. Uh, and there, I mean, th there's multiple others that I won't list right now. So you have a, we have a, th so this, this result gives you a very, a very uh, precise and remarkable understanding of what, of what these, of, of what the, the, the cylinder decomposition looks like. And you can also, you can also understand um, what the cylinder areas are doing. So here on, I, I've discussed, I mean, here this theorem says what the, what the, uh, how many cylinders there are. But these cylinders, they decompose the area, right? I have, I have about n, I have about n squares. And uh, these n squares are all in different cylinders. So what does the, what do the, um, how, how are the areas partitioned among these cylinders? Oh, uh, let's say the total variation distance between the two is very small in a way that you can quantify as g tends to infinity. Yeah, good? OK. Uh, OK, then Vishan and, and uh, Ming Kyung Lu also have a, have a result toward the end I've described. So if you look at the cylinder areas, you divide by n. So I mean, the, the total area of the cylinder is about n. Here, actually, I should be saying equals instead of less than or equal to. Uh, then this will converge to what's known as a, as a, to a the Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter a half. And this Poisson Dirichlet distribution, it, it's sometimes known, I mean, um, as a stick breaking process for, for a reason I'll describe in a moment. So this Poisson Dirichlet distribution, to define it, what you do is, I'll, I'll, I'll say what it is. So, OK, so this one half, what you do is you, you take uh, ui that are sampled. So these ui live in 0, 1. OK, and what you do is you take uh, these uis according to a probability distribution with density dx over root x over uh, 2 root x. Oh, OK, so this integrates to 1 on the interval 0 to 1. So these are random variables that lie between 0 and 1. These are all independent. You and this, what, this uh, sorry, you have x to the one half, and you have a one, you have a one half times one over x to the one half. So this is the one half here. If you had a theta here, you'd do one over, you do theta times x to the minus theta, and you do u one times u two minus u one times u three minus times one minus u one times one minus u two. So you imagine that you have a stick of length one. I cut it at my first u. Okay, so that gives me the first length. Then my the, the piece that's remaining, I again cut it according to my second u, and I keep going. OK, so this is called the Poisson Dirichlet distribution. OK, so this is telling you what these cylinder areas are doing. And the thing that the, 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 the reason I'm, uh, well, I mean, uh, one reason I'm mentioning these results is that they like, I like them quite a lot, and they have, a lot, they have to do with this largeness, these largeness asymptotics. Uh, but another, another reason I'm mentioning these is that it, it brings out a curious analogy, which is that um, you see the same sorts of phenomena appear in the context of um, a random permutation. So if I look at the cycle lengths of a random permutation, you see the Poisson Dirichlet distribution, and the number of cycles has a Poisson, has a Poisson distribution. So this almost seems to suggest that um, flat surfaces 
I mean, it's sort of a well-known analogy that if I want to look at random hyperbolic surfaces of large genus, these are very closely related to random graphs. It gives you the um, So, I mean, there's a sort of a well-known analogy that random, uh, that random hyperbolic surfaces are kind of closely related to random trivalent graphs. And there are many such results that kind of appeal to this analogy. I mean, this is very suggestive in that maybe flat surfaces have st in, in the li limit of large genus are, are closely related to random uh, permutations. Though, I mean, I think there's a lot to be asked here, but while this sort of analogy is on very strong footing right now, the extent to this analogy, I mean, both of these results are pointed to an analogy that looks like this, but to what extent, I mean, to what extent it can be pushed and whether or not this is, um, whether or not a random permutation is really indeed summarizing more, more, uh, more refined properties of flat surfaces, I guess, remains to be seen. Okay, so anyway, so these are, these are results on, um, on, um, on, uh, the geometry of square tile surfaces. So, how much? T wh when do I end again? Huh? So, forty minutes. Okay, half an hour. Okay, so. Okay. Um, okay. So let me. Okay. So I will. So, the organization of the rest of the talk will be the following. So the first thing I'll do is I'll just quickly mention a few of these. So all this con concerns quadratic differentials. So I'll mention a few results in the holomorphic case where a lot of things are better understood, but a lot of things are worse are, are, are not as well understood. And then I'll, 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 I'll mention a little bit about what goes into the proofs of these results. Okay. Um, so let me let me start by just saying a few things about, about the holomorphic setting. So So I can again talk about volumes, I can talk about siegel veach constants, I can talk about the, whole, uh, the horizontal cylinder decomposition, I can talk, talk about all the same questions, all the same questions there. So, okay, so we have a pretty precise understanding of the volumes and the siegel veach constants. Uh, for all strata, uh, so I'm, I'm always talking about the largeness asymptotics here. Okay, so while the results I said above concern the whole stratum, or more precisely the principal stratum, uh, we have largely in asymptotic results for all strata uh, due to um, works, okay, so this is basically simultaneous works of myself and uh, Chen, uh, Dawe, Martin, uh, uh, Adrian Savage, and Don and Don Zagye. Okay, and I'll, I, I don't want to list the formulas, like what, what the what the what the analog of that actually looks like here. But I'll tell you the Siegel Beach the Siegel Beach uh, constants because that's fairly explicit. So instead of a quarter here, you get a half. So I don't know if you like to think of a a translation surface will give you Siegel Beach constant a, a half in the largeness limit. A half translation surface will give you uh, Siegel Beach constant a quarter. It's almost poetic. Okay, and this is known for all strata. So this is actually, so this is, a, this is a, so I mean, at least, this is maybe some evidence to this conjecture, although there's more evidence uh, just by computer simulation. But I mean, this is, this, the fact that, that the area Siegel Beach constant almost perplexingly does not depend on uh, the stratum is, is a theorem in the case of holomorphic quadratic differentials. Okay, okay so um, now, Okay, so, so every, all strata have, have a, we have a pretty good understanding of volumes and Siegel-Beach constants, okay? Um, now, the geometry, no, this is, a, this, is, this is not well understood in the case of, um, so the, like the cylinder decomposition results as refined as, say, say this, this or this, are not, are not very well understood in the holomorphic case. So, uh, Uh, so this is less well understood, uh, and I think the the one the one result I'll, I'll say in words is that if I ask myself not for the probability distribution on the number of cylinders, but I ask for what is the probability that there is, exists one cylinder, 
then uh, these four authors, uh, so yeah, so again, uh, Vincent, Elise, uh, Anton, and, and uh, Peter, they have, a, they have a good understanding of the asymptotic of the, for the probability that there exists exactly one cylinder. But if I ask for you know, the probability distribution that there are many, so like two, three cylinders, et cetera, this, is, this I think is, is the, the asymptotics of this question are, are open. And then I'll also mention, um, there are also other geometric things you can ask. One, one is the, the covering radius. So if I, uh, if I take each, each saddle, if I, if I take each, um, each conical singularity on my flat surface and I try to draw a disk around these, co these, these, these conical singularities so that uh, I take as small of a radius of the disk as possible and ask to cover the whole surface, how small does that radius have to be? So upper bounds on this were, were proven by, um, by uh, Art Mazur, Anja uh, Kazra Rafi, and uh, uh, Anja Rondecker. So as you can see, uh, something like this bounds on the covering radius. We don't have them in the, uh, in, the in the quadratic case. So I mean, there are, you know, the, 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 I guess the, the reason one of the reasons I'm mentioning this, in addition to just give context on what's known in the holomorphic case, is that there's actually a pretty big mismatch between what's known in the holomorphic case and what's known in the quadratic case. Okay. So with, the, with that said, I guess I'll, I'll turn to uh, two intersection, intersection numbers, uh, which are going to play a, a big role in the, in the proof uh, of this theorem up here. Uh, So okay, so I'm again going to fix uh, some g, which is an integer, and I'll fix n, which is now at least one, and uh, we're going to assume that two g plus n is at least three, and we'll let m g of n is the, uh, denote the moduli space of um, smooth genus g curves. Uh, with n marked points, and I'll let mgn bar denote its Dillian Mumford compactification. This is, this is the set of uh, stable curves with unmarked points. Okay, we'll let uh, li denote. Uh, so Li is the line bundle on MGN bar whose fiber um, okay, over some point. So let me call the point C. So C is the stable curve, and the end mark points are x1, x hold up to xn. So this is some stable curve in MGN bar uh, is uh, T x is the cotangent bundle uh, at, at, at the ith mark point, so the ith, ith mark point of C. So this is some line bundle, and then I'll let uh, psi i denote the first term class. Uh, is the first uh, of L i. So okay, so these are among the most basic classes that you have on M G N bar. Okay. okay. So um, okay. So now for any for any n tuple d, which is d one, d two, all the way to d n, I'll define. We can define uh, this intersection number tau d one, tau d two, all the way to tau d n. So this is just the intersection between, so these tau's actually, so tau doesn't have, tau you should view as a symbol. So I mean, these objects kind of arose in, in the context of quantum gravity where tau is a natural, uh, a fairly common notation for a correlation function. But now, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the tau is a little bit of a distraction here. It's just, again, it's just notation that's been borrowed for the past 30 years. Um, so the real things that you should keep in mind are these, these subscripts. So this is psi 1 to the d1, psi 2 to the d2, all the way to psi 
n to the dn, and I'm integrating over the full moduli space. Uh, so this is non-zero. Um, Only if uh, the sum of the di is equal to 3g plus n minus 3. And I'll often refer to the sum as d bars. Okay. Okay, so now if you don't like uh, this definition in terms of intersection theory, of intersection theory, there's another interpretation for these intersection numbers that's more, um, I mean, in terms of. Uh, uh, ribbon graphs. So I'll, I'll just quickly give you the structure of what it looks like without without going into too much detail, it's just so that you, you have some feel maybe for how these look. So, okay. So I'll give you a formula. This formula I should I should accredit it. Um, So this is due to Kansevich back in 1982. So, um, okay, so let me write down the formula and then I'll, I'll explain it quickly. Um, So on the left side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count ribbon graphs. So, so these are metric ribbon graphs. So I mean, I think um, there have been a few talks on metric ribbon graphs, including those of Francisco and, and Elise. So uh, an, um, a ribbon graph is, is a graph that has a cyclic orientation at each vertex, whose edges are cyclic, have a cyclic orientation at each, at each vertex. So locally, the graph looks like this. So I have just a vertex and then a bunch of edges around it, and I have a cyclic orientation of them. That might look like this. And then maybe I have another vertex, and then this has some edges, and then I have a cyclic orientation of this vertex, et cetera. Okay, RGN, okay, so now that's what a ribbon graph is. A metric ribbon graph, as you might imagine, is just a ribbon graph that has a number, a positive number associated with each edge. So that's in particular putting like a metric on the graph, okay? Um, what, 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 what one does in this context is looks at Met integral metric ribbon graphs. So these are ribbon graphs with, an, with a number at each edge, and that number is a non-negative integer. Okay? And of, of genus G, so that's this G here, with n boundaries. And we assume that this ribbon graph Okay, sorry, I'm not writing this very well. Uh, is is trivalent? So each each vertex is degree, is degree three, so three regular. Okay, so you sum over all ribbon graphs that are trivalent that have an integer a non-negative integer associated with each edge, genus G with n with n boundaries. Okay, um, so R is R is being summed over them. You divide by the number of automorphisms, which is which is a fairly standard thing to do, and this n R of B one through B n. This is the number of uh, metric ribbon graphs. Uh, okay, so this is the number of integral metric, metric ribbon graphs with, with boundary lengths. So I say that they're n boundaries, but now since I have a metric, since like, each edge is, has, 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 has an integer associated with it, I can assign a length to each boundary. So, with, so I can say with boundary, so I can fix so what this is doing here is that this is fixing the n boundary lengths. Okay, so you're basically summing over all of them with a, with a given boundary, okay? Uh, and this, this will be given by, this, so this is a certain generating function for these intersection numbers. So this is gonna give you a sort of a, this, you can view it as if you like a combinatorial definition of these intersection numbers. Okay, so as the b's tend to infinity, there's going to be kind of a leading order homogeneous term. Okay, up to some power of two, which you can kind of ignore for the purposes of this talk. 
and up to some sort of fact double factorials, which you can also not really pay too much attention to, the coefficients, if you expand in Bs, are given by these intersection numbers. So this is just a combinatorial definition of these, of these objects. Okay, so I'm gonna go over there now. Um, okay, so, okay, so now why, why are these useful? Okay, so I, I went from volumes to these intersection numbers. So, I mean, so the hints that this thing would be useful had, had already been explained in, in, in the talks of uh, Elise, who did it in the context of square tiled surfaces. And um, I mean, Francisco actually did, did something similar in the, context of, um, in the context of hyperbolic geometry. So this work that I had mentioned before, uh, they express these volumes uh, as sort of polynomials Of, of these intersection numbers. With the basic idea being that a ribbon graph kind of forms a skeleton of the quadratic differential in a certain sense. And from that, you can, you can, uh, you can express uh, counts of these quartile surfaces in terms, of, in terms of various things associated with counts of these ribbon graphs, which are in turn related to these intersection numbers. Okay, so if I just black box a vague statement like this, I tell you that you can express these volumes in terms of these intersection numbers, and then I'm telling you that I somehow managed to take the Lorentz asymptotics. Somewhere, I mean, even if you don't necessarily know exactly, exactly the formula yet, there's no getting around the fact that I'm gonna have to compute some kind of asymptotic of this object, okay? So in the, in, in, indeed, this is the case. So I, I, you require um, asymptotics. Okay, that's a GN here um, for, for these intersection numbers, as g tends to infinity, and you actually have to also have to let n tend to infinity. And the, the scaling that's required, that's really relevant, is as n as, as when n is of order log g. Uh, that turns out to be relevant if you start analyzing these formulas. Okay. So okay. So let me now state a theorem uh, to this to, to this extent, and then for the remainder of the talk, what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll give you a heuristic behind the proof of this theorem. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a theorem that something is tending to one, but these things don't actually tend to one. So what I'm gonna do is divide out by, by what these things actually converge to, and then that whatever that quotient is will tend to one. So, um, so I'll set, so remember D is an n-tuple. So D is like D1, D2 all the way to Dn. So we'll define D of Gn to be uh, this, this guy over here. Okay, and then I'm going to divide out by uh, what its limit will eventually be. So I'm going to multiply by 24 to the g, g factorial times the product of 2di plus 1 double factorial over uh, 6g plus n, 2n minus 5 double factorial. And uh, double factorial is just the product of all of the, uh, I guess I've been using it at se several points. It's the product of all of the odd numbers up to my integers. So. Uh, one times three, all the way to one plus um, two di plus one. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So eventually, what I'm going to say is that this thing converges to the reciprocal of this. So the, the theorem to that extent will be okay. So so okay. As as g. as g tends to infinity, this sort of what I'll call a normalized intersection number um, tends to one if n is equal to, if n is equal to little o of squared of g. Um, okay, so this is, this, is, this is a theorem statement for these intersection numbers. Let me actually clarify, uh, I, I don't want to be too formal about this, but I mean, in general, but let me sort of clarify what I mean by this, because there are various things that are happening here. You're, you have like some, some n-tuple, and then you have, a, you have some n-tuple, which is d, and that's ranging over all possible n-tuples, and then I have a, I'm also ranging n, and I'm letting g tend to infinity. Let, let me just exactly cl clarify what I mean by this. Okay, so uh, at, the, at the expense of having two limbs and two maxes in a statement. So, uh, so what I mean by this is that I, I um, okay, so, Okay, so what I'm first going to do is I'm, okay, I should go backwards actually. So, um, 
OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is take the maximum overall d's, n tuples d, that are summing to 3g plus n minus 3. As I said before, the intersection number is, I, can, I, can, I don't have to think about it unless, unless that's the case, right? It's going to be 0 otherwise. OK? Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is, is sum over all, so these are, these are n tuples. So the next thing I'm going to do is max over all n that are less than or equal to some epsilon squared of g. So that is sort of incorporating this condition. OK, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take the limit as epsilon tends to 0, which is the little o. And the next thing I'm going to do is take the limit as g tends to infinity. So I'm doing them this, 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 and then this. OK, and then I take, um, I take this normalized guy, minus 1, and then this, this is 0. So that's how to make sense of, uh, of the statement. That's how you would formally, uh, formally make sense of the statement. OK, so th that's what the theorem, the theorem is saying. OK, and once you have this, now I have a handle on these guys. So now I have a handle on, I have a vague handle on what this formula is doing. And then I have a shot, at least, of trying to do, see what the asymptotics of this volume is doing. OK, now that is a huge, that, that is a bit of a, uh, an oversimplification, because this formula itself, in terms of this, is quite nasty. So I mean, actually, in a sense, I mean, you could say that this theorem might take, I don't know, like a third of the paper. And this one will take more than a third. So. Um, Get this, this given this would take more than a third. But I mean, this is kind of the, the pretty, this has a pretty elegant uh, heuristic behind it. So I will just, I will focus on this. Um, okay. Okay, so a few remarks that I want to make are, first of all, the asymptotics of this, again, it, it's, it's going to, um, There's again a there's sort of a universality phenomenon that you almost see here, which is that um, the asymptotics almost uh, do not depend on d. Okay, well now you're going to say, well, come on, you just you just you just normalize by the dependence on d. I mean, I just I just normalize by the the product of the two di double factorial, right? Uh, but actually, this is a fairly standard normalization in this context, so I, that's why I say the word. Almost. I mean, if I kind of multiply through by this product of 2di double factorial, 2di plus 1 double factorial, they don't depend on d. And this product, I mean, it's fairly ubiquitous in this context. Um, okay, so the second is that the theorem is false if n is scaling like squared of g. So I have this condition that n is little of squared of g. That, that condition is, in a sense, sharp. Um, uh, if, if I actually make n scale like squared of g, then the theorem is false. And I can just give you an example. So I have one, I have one of the di's that is 3g minus 2. And then I have a bunch of other gi's that are, that are all equal to 1. OK? And this is looking like e to the uh, n squared over 12g. So the moment n is, say, squared of g, I have e to the 1 12th. And this is not 1, right? So, OK? Okay, and the third statement is that if you instead if you instead constrain uh, n to be le le less than some c log g, uh, then there's an alternative proof following this one. Uh, 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 that came later on by uh, Guo and Yang. Uh, and, okay. okay, so with those remarks made, I want to now turn to a proof outline for this theorem. Unless there are any uh, <coughs> questions. Sorry? OK, so, so what you can do is, OK, so th there are various ways of computing these intersection numbers, OK? And if you have, say, in the, uh, the, these ways kind of depend on, the, on this n, OK? So there's always a recursion, which I'll write down soon enough for these intersection numbers, OK? And if n is small, you can write down formulas with the interse these intersection numbers. And these formulas kind of blow up exponentially in n. Like, they get, way wor they get much worse as, as n gets bigger. You can view them kind of as their complexity kind of growing as n factorial. So the moment n is like log g-ish, you can hope to have a handle on them. But if n is much bigger than log g, then you have like some exponential, something exponentially complicated in the power of n, and that's, that's a total disaster. Does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. 
Uh, please. Yeah. I mean to say that you can in principle imagine this thing. I mean, okay, so. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so I have many possible Ds that sum up to 3G plus I minus 3, right? Okay, and after this normalization, which I don't really count, I mean, this sort of, I have this 2Di plus 1 fa double factorial. Ignore that, because as I said, it's somewhat standard to normalize by that. Then all of these different Ds that will give you the same sum of 3G plus I minus 3 will give you the same asymptotic for the intersection number. That's what I mean. I mean, see, yeah, you're restricting to a class of Ds, but all, any, any choice of D in that class will give you more or less the same value. Well, I mean, you have many possible Ds that will, that will, I mean, so yeah, G is going to infinity. So G is, G is large, say like 10, 10 billion, right? There are many, many, there are many possible Ds that will give you, that, that will sum to 3G plus I minus 3. In principle, they could all be different. But they're not. They're not. That, 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 that's what I mean to say, yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, so in that case, I will proceed. Okay, so, um, uh, right. Okay so, okay, so as I just mentioned, actually, uh, so Francisco's question was, was a good uh, segue. So in the case of small n, this theorem is well understood. So uh, if, if I have n equals 1, then it's exact in the sense that this d, uh, this 3g minus th 2, so I just have one, one, one number here. My d-tuple is just a, one, uh, just a single number. This number is exactly it's equal to 1 on the nose, OK? And this, this really falls from, uh, this is, falls from more or less the Witten conjecture, uh, which was proven by Kontsevich. OK, so n equals 1 is good. OK, so I have root n minus 1 things to go. Um, OK, so let's. Okay, so now, okay, so I, I talk about n equals one, where it's exact. Okay, n equals two. Uh, there are there are formulas for this thing. So this, and which have been well understood. So again, this, this group of four people. What they showed is that um, for any choice of d one and d two that sum to three g plus two minus three, this thing is equal to one plus some order. 1 over g correction, which is basically 1. Um, and this is based, uh, so this is g2, so this is based on a tractable expression for uh, the two point uh, intersection number. So the n equals 2 case. So, right. Okay, so now I've told you what happens when n equals 1 and n equals 2. And actually, so once, once I have these objects, I can start to, um, okay, so I, okay, so now I have to deal with it when n is actually kind of bigger than that. Okay, so how do you actually, I, I just told you sort of abstractly what these things are. First, I gave you a, an, intersection, an intersection theoretic definition. Then I kind of briefly, briefly outlined a, a combinatorial definition. But I actually haven't told you how to compute these objects. Okay, and those are done through what are known as the uh, the, the Virasoro constraints, uh, or also known as the the Witten's conjecture. And 
and this basically gives you a recursion, uh, a recursion for these intersection numbers tau d1, tau d2, tau dn. Okay, and it was proven uh, proven first. by uh, Kansevich in 1992. And then there have been many proofs following that, including those of Okunkov and Pandarapande, by Merzikhani, by Kazari and Lando, and, and various others. Okay, and uh, so let me give you a basic idea of what this, of what this recursion looks like. So I'm gonna fix, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, take an intersection number of, um, so I'm gonna fix some k at least one, and some n-tuple d, which is d1, d2, all the way to dn, okay? And what the, 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 the thing that you can basically do is you can write k plus one d. So here I have, um, okay, so this d is summing to, I wanna make, I wanna view my intersection number as this. So tau of k plus one, tau d1, tau d2, all the way to tau dn. So I want the sum of these to all, so I have, I'm gonna have n plus one numbers here, and I want the sum of these to be 3g plus n plus one minus three. So this forces the, the size of d to be uh, 3g plus n minus k minus three. I mean, you can just check that if I sum, sum this and this, I will get 3g plus n plus one minus three, okay? So we'll give you a formula for this guy, and this formula will qualitatively consist of three terms. Okay, now I just want to tell you about the structure of these terms and how to exploit that structure in order to, to get some handle on the asymptotics of these intersection numbers. Okay, so the first term, okay, so the first term, okay, so the first term is of the form, um, okay, so the first term is gonna be of the form A, okay, so you're gonna sum over Okay, so I started with an n plus one point intersection number. So I have k plus one, which is my first component, which I've kind of singled out. And then I have n other guys, d1, d2, all the, all the way to dn. So this is n plus one parts. So the first term is gonna be a linear combination of things that only have n parts. Okay, so I'm reducing the number of, of, of entries in this recursion. Okay, and then I have some constant factor up here. I have some constant factor up here, which I'm hiding right now. I don't wanna, I don't wanna tell you what it is. It's, it, but it's explicit. I can tell you what it is if, if I had another hour. Uh, so, okay, and then I sum over d, d, uh, d prime. The second term will do the opposite. Okay, so the second term, um, so I'm gonna say b, so this is, an, another, again, another, another family of constants. Okay, so by, by chance this will decrease the genus, but it will increase, the real problem that I want you to pay attention to is the n. So the second term will increase uh, increase the number of points, okay? And the third term, the third term will be uh, quadratic. So, uh, that's a d hat and d tilde. Okay, and I, I'm not gonna tell you what subscripts go here because actually these terms are not gonna matter a whole lot. Okay, so this is sort of, this is sort of, um, on a structural level, what, what, these, what, these three th what these three terms look like. And uh, a structure like this is fairly ubiquitous in the context of uh, topological recursions and things like that. Okay, okay now, now this, okay, so I, this looks somewhat complicated, okay? I mean, I have to run this recursion. But if, you, if you check, I mean, you can, you can check, I didn't tell you what the g's in the end are here, but what you can check is that, I mean, uh, at least over here and over here, 3g plus n minus three, so like sort of the, uh, the dimension of, uh, of the associated moduli space is decreasing by one each time I apply the recursion, okay? So I, in principle, I would have to apply the recursion 3g, time, 3G plus n minus three times, 3g-ish times, in order to get down to the initial condition. And that is problematic, right? I incur some error at each step, and then uh, that error will blow up if I applied the step too many times. Okay, so I wanna somehow not apply the step too many times. And in principle, I actually kinda wanna apply the step n times, okay? 
So, uh, so things are, are not looking maybe good at the, uh, at the start, but let's try to see if we can sort of be honest and see which parts of, these, of, this, of this recursion are, are the most complicated and try to sort of cut the complexity bit by bit so that we get something more tractable. Okay, so the first, the, maybe the most complicated term, so this is sort of a quadratic term. This decreases n, this increases n. Okay. So the, the, I mean, so whenever you have something linear, uh, whenever you have something nonlinear, the hardest term is usually the nonlinear part. Okay, so uh, so okay, yeah. So this term three is the nonlinear part, and I'll it looks the most complicated. But what will happen is that in the large genus limit, we'll luck out, and sort of three becomes small. Okay, it's very small. It's like one over g squared ish. So even if I apply the recursion g times, uh, this 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 third, the quadratic term will be more or less irrelevant for the asymptotic behavior. So I can just omit. I'm going to omit three. Okay. So I mean, so so what you would get is something like the intersection number you're after. Is approximately equal to. I've done a I've done an approximation by omitting this third term, is equal to something that increases n. Oh, sorry, the, the first term will decrease n. Um, and the second term will will increase n. Okay. So all I've done so far is I've, I've kind of told you at least that three is small. Hopefully, I mean, this is not, this turns out to not be so difficult to prove. Uh, actually, the, C, the, constants, the reason is that the constant C is actually quite small. Uh, so you, you'll be able to just drop it without, without suffering too much, okay? And then you're left with something like this. Now the problem is that I again have to, even if I have a recursion like this, it's totally linear now, but I'm anyway gonna have to apply the recursion 3G times to get back to the, uh, to, back to the initial data because, um, Again, each, each, each of these steps will decrease the dimension by one, and the dimension starts out as 3g plus n minus 3. Um, so, I this is a two here. Um, so I'm going to have to apply the recursion many steps. OK, so now what's the problematic term? This decreases n by 1. And my goal, remember, the thing that I know very well is I know what these things are doing for small n, for n equals 1 and 2. So in principle, I what I want to do is I want to run this recursion so that I just hit n equals 1 or 2. The problem is that this point is kind of throwing you off, right? This, this, term, is, this, this term is increasing n. So the thing that I like to do in the spirit of this is I like to just drop this term. OK, so, okay, so, so this is kind of the bad term because it's stopping me from, from, from simplifying the problem by, uh, by immediately reducing to the initial, initial condition. OK? So now your hope is that you can just drop the bad term. But the problem with doing that is that you'll get the wrong answer. So this time, if you just try to run the same recursion but just ignore the box term, put it on a computer, say, you won't get 1 as the answer. You'll get something much smaller than 1, which tells you that dropping the, uh, the box term um, is something that you can't do to get a, to get a correct answer. So instead, your hope is that uh, the, the sort of term 1 dominates 2 after you apply the recursion many times. See, 1 is decreasing the n, and 2 is decreasing. Oh, OK, yeah. Um, OK, I'll, I'll just quickly wrap up here. 1 is decreasing n, and 2, two is de increasing n. So in particular, you can imagine that uh, 1 you can hope that 1 will decrease n faster than 2 will. 2 will increase it. And that is indeed what, 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 what will happen here. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm running very low on time. So, uh, but in order to conclude, what I'll say is that you view this recursion as a random walk on the variable n. OK, so the thing that you'll see is that the sum of a d's plus the sum of b d's is approximately equal to 1. So let me pretend it's exactly equal to 1. And what you can view this as, as an expectation. So I, I sample uh, some d with probability, say, a d over 1. 
or this d double prime will probably be b, b d double prime. Okay, so I, then I keep on applying this 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 sort of sampling, and what I'll do is I'll if I, if I apply the sampling many times, what I'll get is that this intersection number is the expectation of some intersection number that's sampled in this way, where I, I kind of sample a d uh, a, a d um, according to this probability distribution, and the point is that this a this this thing here will be at least two thirds. And this thing here will be at most one third. So this random walk on n, it will have a drift in the negative direction, and this will uh, this will eventually push you down to, to the small n case. So I guess that's a, that was brief, and I apologize about. But I apologize. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you.